right, here we are, lecture number four, and last in clustering. And uh, I wanted to start by the, talk, by the um, course overview. We have gone all the way from number one to down to here. And in fact, I have pretty much finished telling you about at least the, a sample of representative clustering algorithms for both vector data and graph data, both parametric and non-parametric. So what is left? Today I'm going to talk about issues that are maybe not necessarily um, that are uh, sort of interesting for all cluster algori clustering algorithms, although the solutions, uh, of course, differ from paradigm to paradigm. And then I'm going to talk about, or at least mention, I can't say that I'm going to teach much, but I'm going to mention other related paradigms that appear in clustering. And that falls under special topics. Also, there will be time for um, questions of your own, so um, probably some place between these two, I will stop and or I will invite you to ask me other things that you want to know, open to the public. I sincerely don't know if I have too much or too little for today. So it, it, there is a chance that we, we finish before uh, the two hours are up. And this being said, We'll go now to page right. We can go there. Cluster validation. So we run the clustering algorithms, and now we want to know if we actually found some clustering that is good or not. For some algorithms, this is part of, of model selection. So when we choose k, we implicitly choose the best clustering with, with that given k. And so um, that doesn't, uh, this comes on top of what I have talked about there. So those can be also considered methods of cluster validation. But what else is there? There are two ways of validating a clustering. One, when, when we know the truth, and that's called the external cluster validation. That's in some sense that's cheating, but, or it's learning about the algorithm, but it is possible sometimes to have a, a, a label, label data and just test your algorithm against the true clustering, and that's called external. Uh, internal is, as the topics I touched on before, how good is the clustering by itself without knowing what the true clustering should be. Okay, so when do we want to do external cluster validation? Sometimes we just want to see how the algorithm that on that particular, uh, did on that particular, on my particular data set uh, D, and so I compare uh, the data set the clustering on the data set with the truth. And I, I want to see how far they are apart. And of course, I need a distance for that. I need to measure somehow quantitatively how that is. So this will be about distances between clusterings. Um, and you see that there are many distances. I'm not going to present many. I'm going to eliminate a lot of them, and still you'll see a, a number of them. Um, so when you, when you're faced with so many choices, the question is, how do I choose a distance? And I suggest that you choose a distance but, but by what you're going to do with it. Yes. Uh, not how it looks like. So what am I going to do when I compare a clustering with the truth? Why do I do it? Uh, well, one good reason to do that is because you're actually in the business of producing clustering algorithms or in the business of using clustering algorithms, and you want to know what is the best clustering, which algorithm is better. Or you want to know which algorithm is better in a particular domain. So what are you going to do? You are going to run the, uh, this, this, uh, a clustering algorithm many times, or several clustering algorithms, and compare these distances. So these distances will be subtracted from each other by means of comparison. You want to see which is the largest, which is the smallest. 
or you are going to do it on multiple data sets and compare between data sets and over data sets. So you, you'd rather have a distance that um, does not depend on the data set, does not depend on the, uh, on the size of the data set, and hopefully does not depend on the number of clusters. Because if you make, you want to make the comparisons as even as possible. Of course, it's still for you as a scientist to make sure you don't compare apples and oranges, but you want a distance that actually doesn't create differences when there are none, or where there should. So now that we said what we would like in principle for, from a distance, let's repeat it since I've put it down. Um, but typically, everybody wants a distance that's positive, uh, preferably a metric, which means a base triangle inequality and is symmetric. So things like kolbach libra divergence would not do. And uh, a big, big requirement when you talk to people who use distances is that it's understandable. And that's actually the hardest to satisfy or the one that I have biggest problems with. Yeah? Yes, just to be a metric, and the reason it, we want it to be a metric is because metrics are understandable. People, people's intuition is in metric spaces. So for instance, people's intuition is that if two things are close to a third, they are close together. Yes. So we all think, it, think that way, and it's very hard to imagine things otherwise. And so if things are not a metric and this is violated, um, it's pretty hard to understand or to predict, to interpret. So it, okay. And so I will argue that in my, in my op opinion, two things that people understand well are Euclidean space and ratios, things that look like probabilities, proportions. And you'll see that um, there are a lot of uh, distances that look like proportions and very little that look like Euclidean space. And I'll explain why if there is time or interest. But no matter what clusterings we use, or no, no matter what distance we use, we start from the same uh, sufficient statistics from the data, which is the confusion matrix. So to go through the notation, I have two clusterings. They don't necessarily have to have the same cluster, number of clusters. N sub k will be the number of points in each cluster. And then we want to know how they overlap so I take the intersection between any cluster in the first clustering and any cluster in the second clustering, and I compute these numbers m, k, k prime. And this is called the confusion matrix. And I'll make a drawing that looks like this. Suppose that you have to cluster the data in um, this rectangle. This is what actually image segmentation does. It takes a bunch of pixels. and breaks them into parts. And so you can break them this way. Let's make things simpler. And this would be C1, C2, and C3. Or maybe another segmentation algorithm breaks them like this. C1 prime, C2 prime. And now, the number of data in this intersection is m, uh, two, um, three, two. Let's go row and column, yes? Is the number of intersection, intersection between c3 and c prime two, cardinality. And uh, the set of these numbers uh, is the confusion matrix. So if the cluster, it's, I hope you see that if the clusterings are the same, then uh, I'll have zeros everywhere except, well, they couldn't be the same because there are three and four. But suppose I have three, and, uh, three, three clusterings with the same number, two clusterings with the same number of clusters, then the best case when they're equal, I get um, zeros everywhere except for on, on the diagonal on the, of the matrix, yes? which means that clusters are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Yes. Or if not on the diagonal, on a permutation of a diagonal matrix. So any distance that is usable should 
give a distance zero for that pattern. And the question is, what do we do? And that is actually very easily achievable. The question is, what do we do in the rest? But before we talk about more about the rest, um, we also want the distance not to depend on the labeling of the clustering. So if I permit the rows of the co or the columns of this matrix, I should get the same distance. And third, I'm going to introduce one more notation. Um, I'll go to probability, so I'm going to divide by the number of points. Yes. And I'm going to divide everything by the number of points. So part in particular, um, I have PK and PK prime, the probabilities of induced by the clusterings on the sample. This is just elementary. And everybody starts from here. Then the first distance is the simplest, and in some sense, a very natural and useful one. I don't have a bibliographic source from it because I think it has been reinvented many times. A student in my department reinvented it the last time I know. Um, so here it is. It's called the I, I call it the misclassification error distance. It comes with lots of names. Uh, it's the following. I look for, what I want to do is basically to find a matching between these two, uh, these sets of clusters that maximizes the MKK. That's the best matching, the best uh, match labeling. And then what doesn't, uh, what falls in that is basically what the clusters agree on. And what falls outside is what the clusters don't agree on. So suppose that the matching goes like this. These two clusters agree a lot. These two agree a lot. And now this guy agrees best with uh, this guy. Yes. Then the sum of what's not cross-hatched is the error, is the place where the clustering disagree. And that is what's written here. Um, as uh, the misclassification error. This corresponds to, to treating the clusterings as classifications and uh, computing the classification error, the probability of a mistake, and then trying all the possible relabeling so that I minimize them. And that's exactly what I read. It looks daunting, but in fact, there is an algorithm, the max maximum bipartite matching algorithm, or the Hungarian algorithm, that solves it in polynomial time. It's a linear programming algorithm. And this is actually a small problem. K is not large. So it's, computing it is not a problem. Also, a nice thing is that it is actually you can prove that it's a Hamming distance. Do you, well, if you know what a Hamming distance is, yes? But anyway, it, you can prove that it's a metric. So it's very simple to show it follows that uh, it, uh, it obeys the triangle inequality. And as I said, it's very popular. Um, it's also bounded between 0 and 1 being an, uh, a misclassification error metric. And in fact, uh, it's bounded to by uh, away from 1. So you can't, uh, uh, well, with k clusterings, you can't get uh, uh, close to, too close to 1, which would be complete disagreement. And complete agreement would be 0. Yeah. But um, what's the major problem with it? It's uh, a bit coarse in the sense that um, suppose that these are the points in, so it doesn't take into account at all what happens on these other blocks. So it only looks how much mass is in th these three blocks, and it never takes into account the distribution of mass into these blocks. And that's a bit coarse because uh, there can be variations that can give me, that will give me exactly the same distance, but for us perceptually it will be the same. So let me see if I can think of an example. So suppose that there, was, there are only two points here. Yeah. Well, and zero points here. Then I get a distance. Or let's put it this way. Suppose that all the mass in these blank areas was concentrated here. And it was zero everywhere, so that, that would be a lot of agreement, yes? That gives me one distance. Now if I take this mass and I distribute it 
uniform along, along this, which means a lot more disagreement, because this is the areas, these are the areas where I assume I disagree, I will get exactly the same distance because the distance only looks at the sum of these, of what's missing from the match. And uh, this is fine as long as the agreement is high. As long as this distance is small, like smaller than 10%, it really doesn't matter what happens with these points. But as soon as this distance becomes large, I, I'm going to get a lot of clusterings that look very different and they give me the same distance from the target one. So it just it lacks discrimination, but otherwise it's very understandable and uh, it's a metric too. Now I'm going to talk about a metric that has a lot of discrimination and it's very different from the others because it's not bounded. It's called variation of information. And as before, we are going to take the probabilistic uh, definitions of cluster sizes, but moreover, we are going to assume also a sampling model, a very simple sampling model, which says that um, if I pick up one of the points at random with probability one over n, um, I'm going to think as pk and pkk prime as what's the probability of observing this point, and I'm going to think of its labels k and k prime as two random variables. So the model is I sample a point at random and I observe k and k prime. And of course, k and k prime will be identical if the clusterings are identical. And uh, how will they be if I have this model here? For these two clusterings. If I sample a point independently in the rectangle. Well, in this case, uh, the label on the rows and the label of the on the columns will be independent because no matter from what row I pick the point, I have the same probability of falling in any of these groups. So these clusters are in some these clusterings are in some sense independent, and that means they are far away. No matter that I can disagree, uh, make them disagree on some parts of the data. Yeah. So. Uh, the two random variables k and k prime could be depend, uh, completely dependent, independent, or in between. And in fact, I'm going to change the drawing soon and make an in-between case. And now I'm, I'm going to ask myself, how much information is between the two labelings? And the more information, the, the closer the clusterings. And the less information, the further away, of course. However, there is a catch. And the catch is that I don't really want to know how much, so the amount of information between two clusterings is how much they have in common. I want to know how much they disagree. And that will come on the next page. But first I want to give a little in introduction. I want to make sure that you see at least once these fundamental uh, concepts of information theory. So how many of you know what the mutual information is? Some, but you are not brave. Okay, so then I'm going to go somewhat fast. So the entropy of the random variable is defined by sum of p log p, and because these are smaller than one, I put a minus. And uh, as probably most of you know, it measures the amount of uncertainty in the random variable. So it's maximum when the distribution is uniform, and zero when the distribution is deterministic. There is no uncertainty. And here are the bounds. If I have two random variables, of course, that's a joint distribution. I can calculate the, uh, the entropy of the joint distribution. And this looks like this, very trivially. And of course, because I measure uncertainty, uh, entropy has this very nice property that the uncertainty in the two variables can't exceed the sum of the uncertainties in of, them, of them taken separately. In particular, if I have if the two clusterings are the same, observing the second one doesn't give me more, uh, it's pre completely predictable from the first one, so sh it should not add uncertainty. And the slightly more convoluted concept is conditional entropy. And this is the expression. What it says is, uh, I know that a random variable, in this case delta prime, the second label of clustering, has some uncertainty. But now I observe the first label, how much uncertainty is left? And that means subtracting from the original entropy of the second label, the mutual information 
the information given by the first about it. And that will probably come from the next page. Yes, it does in some sense. Here is the mutual information. So the mutual information is defined as the entropy of the second variable before I observe the first minus the uncertainty in the second variable that's left after I observe the first. Which means that the difference in uncertainty was the information I received, I. So there's a famous Venn diagram to go with this. This is the entropy of the first clustering. This is the entropy of the second clustering. The overlap is the mutual information. Yes. And the union, the union is the joint entropy. Yes. And this picture says that if I observe the first, cl first clustering, I reduce this first circle to nothing. And in particular, I get this much information about the second clustering. And this half moon or so is the uncertainty that remains. No? Are there questions? And the beauty of this picture is that any inference you draw from it is true. Like anything that you think of that has to do with areas um, is qualitatively true. So you can write an equality like the ones up there about it. And now after you've done all this, how do we define the distance between two clusterings? At this point, it should be pretty obvious that the distance is uh, what's left outside the mutual information. So this. plus this. Yeah. And uh, the formula is here. So basically, the formula just says that the distance is what's, what's covered in green in this picture. And it can be expressed in several ways, at least two ways, if not more. OK, so graphically, it's intuitive. But what else can we say? Interestingly enough, well, it's pretty obvious that it's symmetric. But interestingly enough, we can prove that this is a metric. This obeys the triangle inequality. This is somewhat surprising because um, kullback library divergence that you have encountered before, and usually divergences in information theory are, not, are, are both, both not symmetric and do not obey the triangle inequality. So it's somewhat surprising that this does. Um, also, you uh, can think of other properties. In particular, you can think of, let's make a, another drawing. Let's say this is C1, C2, C3. But now the other clustering is something slightly more similar. So, so this is C1 prime, and this is C2 prime. And this is C3 prime. So it's close. And again, we have this finer tessellation of the space that's given by, the, uh, by what's called the joint of the two clusters. So basically, we have all these little compartments that were the, the previous uh, MKK prime. One can think of going from this clustering, the black clustering, to the green clustering in the following way. Take, every cluster, take one cluster here and break it according to this clustering. So basically, there's nothing to break here. But I can, for instance, break cluster C2 into two. And that will get me a little bit closer to the green cluster, because now I have more agreements. And then I can break cluster C3 into two, and that will get me, get me a little bit closer to the uh, to the green clustering. And now if I want to keep getting closer to the green clustering, I have to put these two parts together. And in this case, I'm done. I have moved from, C, uh, from the black to the green clustering. And uh, it's easy to see that for any pair of clusterings, you can, there is a path that goes by breaking up the clusters of 
the first one according to what the second one says and then agglomerating them together, gluing them, merging them together again to obtain the, the other one. Um, and each of these moves requires an entropy or a sort of is, can be measured by an entropy. The variation of information is the sum of this, these steps. So it's like going on the shortest path in some sense from one clustering to the other. And the path is in operations of merging or splitting. Also, I want to add that because I'm talking about shortest path. It's a shortest path, but it's not in a, in a Euclidean space. Yes. In particular, you can see that there, are more, more, there is more than one shortest path to go from the black to the green. And typically, unless I have only one split to do, there is more than one way of doing it. And in fact, there are exponentially many. So it's a very, and I could talk a lot more about this, but basically it's a metric that's, it's a metric on a space that's not Euclidean and has you know, very strange uh, geometry. But going to more practical things, if k is bounded, then this uh, distance is bounded obviously by the entropy of the clusterings. But if k is left unbounded, or if n the sample size is left unbounded, then the distance can be arbitrarily large. Um, is this bad? Some people find it scary that the distance can grow so fast. And actually it seems it grows very fast in practice. On the other hand, uh, the reason it grows so fast is that because if I increase n, the number of clusterings on a set of uh, n samples uh, is a very large number. It's a Stirling number, if you, if you know what that means. Uh, these are combinatorial numbers that grow very fast. Yeah. And that's all I'm going to say about it. So basically, the space of clusterings can grow very, very fast. And so um, and it, the distances can, uh, two things can happen to the distances. First, the space is finer, and so the minimum distance gets smaller. Uh, and second, the space is wider, and so the maximum distance gets larger with n. Uh, but this is, in fact, one of the very few distances that is um, unbounded and in use. Okay. Questions about variation of information? All right. Now, the next set of distances come from statistics and are all much older. Well, I don't know when the... Uh, when the misclassification error was first used. Uh, but possibly, I have never met it in statistics for, for some reason. Um, in statistics, there are various other indices that are used. And I'm going to give you some examples. By the way, when I say index, it means that the maximum is at one. The best possible is at one. And the worst should be at zero. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, you can see the drawings. Okay. And uh, I'm giving a few examples here. Only a few. There are more distances than that, or more indices. Uh, for any two clusterings, I can define uh, N11 is the... I can... So there are N choose two pairs of points in a sample of N size. And if I look at pairs of points, I want to see how many pairs are in the same cluster in both clusterings. And that's N11. So that's the agreement that the misclassification error measures. Uh, then N21 is the number of points that, N12 is the number of points that are in the same cluster in one clustering, but uh, not in the other. So in particular, um, a pair of points, this pair of points, are in both in C2 according to the black, but are in different clustering according to the green. So they are part of N12. Yeah. Whereas this pair of points is in N11, is counted N11 because it's the same in, uh, is in the same clustering in both groups. And then I have an N21, which is the converse of this. And I have an N22, which are pairs that are separated in both clusterings. For instance, uh, this guy with this guy, they're not in the same cluster in either clusterings. So in some sense, uh, the two clusterings agree on this pair and on this pair, but disagree on this pair. 
So the RAND index, which is one of the oldest, said, OK, this is the ratio of ag agreements over everything. Let's use this. It's very natural. But people didn't like it. And do you realize why? Because if you increase k, then n22 dominates. Basically, n22 grows quadratically, and all the other grow linearly with the number of point, with k. And so, if you draw what's the sort of, I'm not going to define it precisely, but let's say the average rand index with, uh, with increasing k, you get curves like this. So this is uh, at one, it's one. At two, it has value 0.45. So the average distance is 0.45. And then it grows towards one. Uh, this depends on, in some sense on the baseline. And I'm not going to go into the details what this baseline, baseline might be. But here, you see that it grows very fast. And by 15, it's at 0.95. So it means that all clusterings will look close in this index. It's really good. No matter what you do, you get a really good score. <coughs> However, people weren't that naive, and so they said, OK, I'm going to adjust it. I'm going to calculate this mean. Oops, I'm sorry. This should have been max. So this is the mean, and this should be the max. And I'm going to normalize by the max. Uh, that has a little problem, because this distance could be smaller than the mean, and then I get a negative index. But this is happily ignored, because we all hope to get good indices. Uh, and so this means that, in particular, I'm working in this space. So I'm linearizing this interval here. And then I'm comparing how far am I. So basically, if I'm halfway in this interval or halfway in this interval, I call this the same. Yes? So if you use the adjusted rand index, that's what you're doing. The same game is played with the jacquard, which said, OK, uh, N22 is really too large and annoying. I'm going to not use it. And then, we, of course, we have a baseline, too, but it goes down. The green is the jacquard. It goes pretty fast down. Yes. Uh, this is slightly better, because then it means at least I'm using the whole interval. But again, it has to be normalized, because the range is not the same. And so on. So there are many normal ad adjusted indices. Some people find them understandable. In fact, I talk to many statisticians which, which say, yes, I have a very good intuition of the um, adjusted rand index. If you are one of them, then uh, good luck. But remember this figure, because it's very important that when you use this index to know what to do. Other things about. Uh, that we may want to look when we talk about distances between clusterings. By the way, the, the ones that are in, in common use are the adjusted rand index, the variation of information, and the misclassification error. And to some extent, I've seen the false mallows, which is a precision recall, basically precision recall in space of clusterings used to. Like some people like it and has some better properties. OK, so a few words about what we can, uh, what other things we'd like to say about these uh, distances. And then I'll, I'll go on to the other topic. Uh, first of all, it would be nice if the distance didn't depend on the sample size. So it's computed by probabilities. Yes. So it's, at first sight, it means that it doesn't really depend on the sample size. That's not completely true. If you do the adjusted indices, they will all depend on the sample size. It's true that this dependence is kind of asymptotes out, so it's weak. Second, you may want other things like, um, suppose here I have a segmentation. Think of this as two segmentations. And now I have another image. And I have some other segmentations here. One is this one, and the other one is um, this one, into two. And now I put them together. How would you like the distances to compose? Yeah. 
So say now I have the total green segmentation, and this is a segment, like this is separated, and the total black segmentation. How would you like them to compose? Maybe you would say, this is twice as big, so I want the distance to be a third of this distance plus two thirds of this distance, some kind of weighted sum. Be careful, not all of these in indices particularly, you can guess, don't do that. Other metrics do. Another question. Again, you have two parts of an image, you put them together. You find the distance, whatever this is and however it is composed. Now, you change this green part to something else. Let's make it dotted. Yeah. How would you like this distance to change? Of course, if they compose linearly, then it, the only contribution is this. However, if they compose non-linearly, then the total distance will depend on what's happening here. So the change in distance here may depend on what's the pattern here, even though the distance between these two is the same. Or take a more, uh, take a more stringent case. Let's say green and black completely agree on this part. If I change what's happening in this part, keeping them in complete agreement, it changes the total distance. For some, metric, for some of the distances, but not for all. So when you use one of them, think of what you want to keep constant and choose it by those, uh, by those reasons. Okay? And they have names for, for instance, convex additivity is the linear combination of the two, and locality means, for instance, that uh, no matter what this partition is here, or the two partitions are here, um, if I change something in this side, it will not, the change in distance will not depend on what's happening on this other side. Okay. And I think I am finished with distances, so let's see if you have questions to ask about this. Then, internal cluster validation. Well, as I said, this is, intimate, um, this is related to selecting the model. And what I said about model selection still holds. However, there is an, another question, which is, if I have different clusterings on the same data set, and I want to keep just one, What's the best? Uh, and perhaps it's the one with the best cost. But if I run it, say I run a k-means algorithm and I run a minimum diameter algorithm, and I run also a graph clustering algorithm, I get three clusterings with three different costs coming from th three different kinds of costs, then how do I compare them? Um, and of course, one, one and very reasonable answer is um, pick the cost that you care most about and compare them with respect to that. Another question is, I got a clustering, only one, but is it a good enough clustering? And sometimes when you are, when you are in one or two dimensions, it's easy to tell. Um, in fact, you don't need to run an algorithm there. Uh, but if you are in many dimensions, it's hard to tell. And so the question is, can we do something slightly better? Uh, one of the things that have been done in the past is heuristics. And here it's, uh, you see again the gap heuristic, but it's not the same gap heuristic. It's just that you know, historically there was another one that was called the gap. Basically, for some cost functions, many cost functions, for instance, single linkage or minimum diameter, you can look at um, measures that give you the separation of the clusters. For, in particular, for uh, the single linkage, you can look at the last edge that, so ln minus k is the last edge that was inside the cluster. And the next one is the last edge that, uh, edge that was deleted. Is there a big jump between the two? Or is it a continuum? If it's a continuum, then I'm not sure that this is a real, a real clustering. Maybe I could go one more or one less. Yeah. It's not clear that there is a stop there and from there on, 
things are separate. And similarly, for um, minimum diameter, we can look at the intercluster inter diameter and the diameter of uh, between uh, distance between two different clusters versus the internal diameter of clusters and get a measure of how compact they are. And uh, if you look through the literature, I put an ETC, there are many measures called slimness or sort of 4K means and even 4EM. There is the ratio between internal cluster variance and intercluster inter variance. So the variance of the largest cluster versus the variance of the whole data set or the variance of the largest cluster or the sum of the variances of the clusters over the sum of the variances between the centers and so on. And they are all used as quality measures for clustering. I don't have much to say besides that because they, they give you an intuition, but that's what they do, intuition. However, there are some special cases when you can say something about clustering. And so these are things that come with proofs. Um, unfortunately, because they come with proofs, you will see in what sense they are not satisfactory enough. So they're more restrictive. We know that what we can say, what we can prove, is not as strong as what al our algorithms can do. Um, but to get more concrete, um, for functions that optimize a quadratic cost, you can get some kind of guarantee of optimality in the following sense. So the cost is, quad first of all, in what sense is the cost quadratic? So I have this L of clustering, the cost of the clustering. And here I have X, which is the clustering represented as a matrix. And I'll show you what the matrix uh, representation of a clustering is. And the cost of the clustering is a quadratic form X transpose AX. But because it's matrix, 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 I have to take the trace. So it's not a scalar. It's a smaller matrix. And I have to take the trace of it. And um, this cost has to be minimized. So when, when the cost is small enough, so when the minimization is good enough, then we can prove that actually we are close to the optimum. Even though the problem is NP-hard and we don't know what the optimum is. Yes? What's the matrix A? I'm sorry? Matrix A. Uh, matrix A is a matrix that depends on the data. So I'm going to show an example on the next slide. So uh, let's think of the k-means cost. But first of all, let's just think of uh, how to represent the clustering as a matrix. Well, there is a very simple representation. Every, I take x to be something that has a column for each cluster, and I put a 1 if the point belongs to the, to, uh, the clustering, uh, to the respective cluster, and a 0 if it's not. So Ah, very good question. So here I have k columns and n rows. And I have 1, 1, 1 here, which means that these are the points that belong to cluster little k. Yeah? And zeros elsewhere. And then again, every one, every row has to have exactly a single one. Yeah? I answered the question in, well, the answer is, the short answer is no. So the question was, can I do it for soft clusterings as well? Um, yes, I can make this matrix for soft clusterings as well. In soft clusterings, every row will be a distribution that sums to 1. What I can't do is I can't prove results about distances for soft clusterings. So I don't know any good distances between soft, distance between soft clusterings. Uh, and that's an almost complete answer. And uh, I don't know how to do this proof that I'm going to show you about show you, or I don't know if anybody knows how to do this, for soft clusterings either. So this is for quadratic cost with hard clusterings. Um, so if you do EM, you don't have these guarantees. Okay, so this is the matrix X. And now I do some uh, normalizations that can be also expressed. I'm not going to go into details, but these normalizations can also be expressed in matrix form or products of matrices. For instance, I want to... Uh, normalize the rows so that the column sum of the, the norm of the row columns is 1, yes? And you notice that if I take the dot product of one column and another column, 
the ones will never match, so I get always 0. So the columns are always orthogonal. If I normalize them, then I get an orthonormal matrix. And from here on, I'm going to think of this matrix as the basis of a subspace. Yes? Um, however, to make it a basis, I have to notice one thing, that the columns sum to 1, so they're not independent. And therefore, I have to remove 1. Anyone is good, because that column will be always determined by the others. So I'm not losing any information. And this will be the matrix X that represents the clustering. What's left? A k minus 1 by n matrix, uh, which, which is orthogonal. And now I can think of this, well, this is a very special k minus 1 matrix that's orthogonal because it has a lot of zeros and the rest 1. So it's also a non-negative matrix. Uh, but I can think of it as embedded in the space of basis for k minus 1 dimensional subspaces. That's the idea. So here I have k minus 1 dimensions. And it's a basis. And now remember what I said, that there is this algorithm that says, do principal components on k minus 1 components, and that will find the centers well. Oh, the rank, so the question is, could it happen that the rank is not full? No, it can't, because if I remove one column, so that's enough. So the rank is k minus 1 for any x that's, that's uh, a clustering. So we can't have columns? Not if this is a clustering. Okay. Yeah, so this is just clusterings. And then I generalize to basis of subspaces, so I'm assuming that they are always orthogonal. So at that space, not of k minus 1, n times k minus 1, but just base orthogonal, or orthonormal k minus 1. Yeah? OK, I'm going to give you the intuition and then stop, because it's time for a break. But basically, now I can relate this clustering represented as a matrix to that fact that I knew, or you have heard before, that if I take um, a, a clustering that's well separated and projected to the k minus 1 principal components of the data, I'm going to get a map of the centers. So the centers will be maximally separated. Or I'm going to find the subspace that defines the centers. And so the clusters will be noise around that subspace. And this is the intuition behind the result that I'm going to give uh, after the break. Thanks. Oh, no, let's see if you have questions first. But there is not much to ask about. Ah, yes. Oh, ask, ask me offline, because I'm not sure what you mean. OK. <laughs> 